All right, guys, we're going to go ahead and get started. Thank you, everyone, for coming. It's good to see a lot of you again. Um, just out of curiosity, do we have anybody that is here that was not at the last one? Um, OK, you guys. And are you part of NXT, or are you coming in from BME? Um, coming in from BME. Coming in from BME? OK, great. So I'll do, I'll do a little intro then um, as we go through, just so you guys know what this is. And if you're interested in the first one, which was on neuroanatomy, um, that will be posted on our YouTube channel if you w are interested in catching up. But I designed this so that you don't have to have any particular background to be able to come in, because this is a different topic still within neuroscience. So as I said, last time we did neuroanatomy. Right now we're doing neurophysiology, which is how neurons communicate together, how they transmit electricity um, and use that for communication. Um, then I'll be talking about neuroprosthetics and brain-computer interfaces next Monday. And then I believe the following Monday, right, John will be talking about neurostimulation um, and devices to help heal and enhance the nervous system. So very quickly, I'll go, I'm going to go through this quickly because I know most of you guys know this already, but for the new people in the room, I'm a fifth year student in RIT's School of Individualized Study and I've been interested in neurotechnology for a really long time. Um, since about 2013, I founded this group as a research club in 2018. Um, and we transitioned to a club at the start of this year to make it more accessible to people. And uh, I'll get into a little bit more what NXT does. Founded a YouTube channel and media company called BCI Guys, where I create educational and easy to understand content around neurotechnology. If you're interested in learning more about this stuff, um, you can just search BCI Guys on YouTube or Instagram or Twitter, and there's a lot of content there. Um, and I'm currently doing some research over at the University of Rochester. Um, and I frequently give talks. I mean, I'm doing these here, but um, at different events for, for Neurotech and run workshops. And so just a quick overview of what NXT is. Um, it's a student club here that deals with neurotechnology. So these are devices that collect electric signals in your brain and in your bodies and use that to control various devices. So we have teams working on a thought keyboard, some games, collecting a big database. Um, and prosthetics, a wheelchair, uh, a lot of different things that everybody's working on. Um, and so we got to go to Dubai once, that was fun, and we do like maker fairs and things like that. We were recognized a couple times um, in various RIT media. Um, again, this was going to Dubai and we do maker fairs and stuff. All right, I wanted to get through that quickly because I know most of you know that, but if you're curious about, if the new people here are curious about what NXT does, please come talk to one of us or really anybody in the group afterwards, as we'd love to have you on board. All right, so neurophysiology. Again, this is how neurons are communicating to each other, transmitting electricity, and how they make that meaningful. So first, we're going to start with the anatomy of the neuron. We're just going to do a quick recap of that, define neurophysiology again, um, talk about the neuron's ions, how it uses ions to transmit electricity and ion channels, the action potential, which is how neurons fire. Um, we're going to talk about some wire properties with a little bit of electrical engineering, although it won't be too in-depth in this, but you can ask questions if you have them. Um, talk about how they receive information, um, and then learning and memory, connectomics, which is how our neurons wire together on the large scale, and then go over some basic neural circuitry. All right. So you may, re may remember from last time, if you were here, that there are three main parts of the neuron that we're going to focus on. So we have the dendrites over here, and the dendrites are receiving information from other neurons. Um, so this is sort of the input. Then we have the soma, which is the cell body. So if, you're, if you can remember back to whatever your last bio class was that you had, whether that was in high school or maybe in college, um, this is just the standard part of, this is the standard part of uh, any cell that has all of that normal uh, cellular machinery that you would expect. Um, but then this really, really unique part of neurons, this is unique too, but especially the axon, because this is structurally different from the rest of the cell. And this is the thing that transmits the signal all the way out. And almost every neuron in the body only has one axon, and it is unidirectional. The charge will go down here, and it's either all on or all off. And so it transmits its signal out there through the axon terminals, which connect to dendrites of other neurons. So again, I kind of went over that, but the dendrites are picking up the signals, and they have these little things called spines there. 
And then this would be an axon of another one coming in to create a synapse. It's just giving you a little bit of a closer view. Um, the soma, again, giving us the uh, machinery of the cell. So this should look familiar to any cell that you've seen before. Um, and then the axon. Another thing here to pay attention to is that we have these um, sort of bead-like structures that we see here that wrap around the axon. Because the axon does not just break up here. That's, this is just for artistic effect, but it would be going all the way through. And these are actually different cells that work to insulate it, which we'll talk about when we talk about wire properties a little bit more. All right, name the parts of the neuron that we just went over. Can anybody tell me what this is here? Yes. Yep, absolutely. I know we did this last time, but I'm just keeping everybody fresh. Uh, how about this center part? Just, yep, very good. And the last part? Yes, very good. Perfect. So there are a couple of different ways that we can classify neurons as well. There, there are hundreds, if not thousands of, actually there are thousands of different types of, of neurons that they classify based on the structures of their dendrites or their axons, but they all kind of fall into these four, um, these four categories here. So you have anaxonic, which don't have an axon, so I know that's confusing based on what I just said, but they transmit signals locally in very small areas. Bipolar neurons, which are good for sensory, um, unipolar, also often involved in sensory, and then multipolar neurons are, this is the most common type that we have, and what I was just showing on that last one, with multiple dendrites springing out from the top and that one clean axon that comes out to stimulate other neurons. And we talked about this last time too, but you may hear the terms white and gray matter. Gray matter is referring to the cell bodies and the dendrites of neurons, and the axons are that wiring, that's that white matter. So if you're looking at an image and you see the lighter areas um, kind of on the inside, that's all of the wiring, and then that outside is where all of those cell bodies are. Um, and then finally, before we get on to the new stuff, there are, I want everyone to remember that there are support cells in the brain that are there to help the neurons fire. Most of the neurons, 90%, or uh, most of the cells, 90% of the cells in our brains are actually glial cells or they're support cells in some way. Um, and so all of these cells just help the neurons function and connect to each other, stay healthy, that kind of thing. All right, so now we can get into what I think is the exciting stuff, neurophysiology. So why study neurophysiology? Um, so this is, this is particularly important in building brain-computer interface devices because we need to understand how they're transmitting electricity to each other or how they're using uh, chemical messengers to send signals. So that's really important, but also if you're uh, using um, like pharmaceuticals to help with any type of ailment of the nervous system, it's really important to understand how those drugs will affect neurons, affect their firing, and how they connect together. And really, this is the underpinning of everything that is going on within our brain. This is how neurons are connecting and communicating with each other. So how do we uh, study neurophysiology? There are a couple different methods. This one you may remember from the last time. But this is actually just taking an electrode and sticking it right into a neuron. So you can see um, this is, for scale, this is 100 micrometers. And you can see those neurons right there in live tissue and a little spike coming in. Um, and that spike is just going to measure what the, the neurons firing rate when they're sending signals. And so that kind of looks like this, which we'll get into a little bit later. And they, so neuroscientists sometimes hook this up to sounds. And so you might hear like little pop, 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 like popcorn. Um, and that's sort of the sound that neurons make when they're firing together that we translate it to. Um, so another way that we look at these, um, at these neurons connecting together and firing together is through retrograde and anterograde tracers. So these are, you use viruses actually, which I think is, is really interesting to change the, the DNA sequence of neurons so that when they fire, they glow a specific color. So these are glowing green and you see those glowing purple. And if we have time, I'll talk about 
how neuroscientists use the rabies virus to actually select for specific neurons and cause them to glow. Um, but this is really, really useful, as you can imagine. When you see a neuron light up, you know it's firing, and then you can see who it's talking to, and that's a really important way that we do this. And then finally, um, there's a book somewhere around here, I see it in the back now, um, that shows some beautiful stained images. Um, so another way that we can look at how neurons are connected is by putting ink in them, basically, and having that move from, uh, from neuron to neuron. And then you get some really, really pretty pictures of the branches of neurons as they spread out. All right. So to understand, so the next part that we're going to kind of shift into is how the neuron is actually transmitting a signal. Because it's quite different than how we would think of electronics, harnessing electricity, and it's important to understand the biochemistry. And so first, we have to go back to whatever your last chemistry class is and talk about this a little bit. So um, first, we have to know about these four ions. So do, do we generally remember what ions are from chemistry class? Yeah, so, um, so here, an ion is when you're gaining or losing an electron um, or multiple uh, so that the charges in your valence shell, so that's the, the outer um, electron cloud, are balanced. And so in this case, we have potassium that has lost an electron, so now it's positive because it has more protons than electrons. So it has lost one electron, so it gets one positive. Calcium, which has lost two. Um, and then sodium, which has lost one. And chloride, which has gained one. So that's why we have a negative symbol here, and then that one positive symbol for sodium, and then the two positive sim symbols for calcium. And I'm going over that because it's really important that we remember what each of those are for these specific ions, because that's going to be very, very important as we go through this. The other things to remember are chemical force and electrical force. So chemical force uh, is stating that the ions or just objects and molecules want to spread out as much as they can generally. So you see a high concentration of, we'll say, ions over in this area. They want to spread out to be as far apart from each other as they possibly can. So this is like if you put dye in water, you notice that over time that dye spreads out to make all of the water red or blue or green or whatever the color is. That is chemical force that is acting, so the tendency for things to move away and spread out. And the other one is electrical force that um, we know of from magnets, where if you have two positives or two negatives, they're going to repel each other, but a positive and a negative are going to come together. Again, these, these are very important to understand for how the, how the brain and how neurons are able to use these to harness charge. So in the neuron, like any cell, we have a cell membrane that is separating the cell, the insides of the cell, from the extracellular space, from what is outside of the space. And so in here, the neuron, or, and other cells do this as well, is trying to find a balance between those electrochemical forces that I was just talking about before. Because in, in real life, you, know, you have a balance of all of these things going on of all of these different ions, and we need to have, and that equals out to a specific charge. And so if we were just to take one at a time, like sodium, for example, we know that there is the chemical force that's acting on it, so they want to move apart. But also, they're both positive charges, so they don't want to be too close to each other. So what we end up getting here is a, um, a voltage of positive 60 millivolts. And so what that means is if we were to measure the voltage here, this means that the, the number that we would get is positive 60 millivolts. And that just means, and so what that ends up meaning is that there are more positive charges on the outside for sodium than there are on the inside. Um, or no, I'm sorry, that was, that was the wrong way. So the inside would be positive because it's measured inside to out. Um, so it, it wants it to be positive 60 millivolts on the inside of this membrane. And so these ions are moving in if this were at zero. Calcium wants it to be 137 millivolts on the inside. 
So it wants to have a lot of calcium on the inside relative to the outside. Potassium is the opposite, so it wants it to be very negative on the inside. And since it is a positive ion, it wants to move out to lower that threshold or to lower that um, voltage. And then chloride finally uh, also wants it to be negative on the inside and it is a negative ion so that means that it is coming into the uh, into the cell so the Nernst equation up here I'm not going to go through because I don't really like math but the Nernst equation is the thing that tells us that gives us these numbers so it helps us find that balance between the electron and chemical force I will post these slides if you're interested in that there are a couple other equations that I will gloss over at the end, but um, you know, that is how we get that number. Oops. So how are we feeling on that? Because I know that was kind of complicated. Does anybody have any questions, or are we generally good? All right, excellent. So when the neuron is at rest, and you have these four ions battling it out, the neuron maintains a membrane potential, a resting membrane potential, at negative 65 to 70 millivolts. Now, this, the point of reference here, zero, is where all of these ions, if, like all of these ions naturally, without any energy applied to them or any other forces, would just equalize across the membrane at zero here. So that's where we get that reference point. So this negative 65 resting potential means that the neuron is doing something to keep it negative. And the reason why it does that is it's building up potential energy. Because these ions will naturally want to equalize out to zero, which means that there's stored energy within the neuron. OK, so how do these charges actually move throughout the, throughout the neuron so that it can harness these for uh, to create action potentials to transmit electricity. So there are several different types of ion channels, um, and there are specific ones of each kind for the ions that we just talked about. So first we have ligand gated, which means that they open and close in response to a chemical. So you would have a little chemical that comes in here, that's what this little triangle is, and that would trigger this channel to open. And all channels are selective for a specific type of ion. And, the, and it's very important to remember that the flow is passive. So again, like I said, it's at negative 65 millivolts. That's far away from zero, which means that there's potential energy stored in there um, that it wants to release to, to open up and let ions flow in. So we have these that are um, activated chemically. We have voltage-gated ones up over there, which means that when the voltage of the membrane changes, that's when they open and let in ions. We have these, which are mechanically gated. So these are actually in your sense of, like your sense of touch. They're in your fingers and your skin. So these start closed like this, but when you press on them, they kind of open and they let ions in. And so that's how that type of ion channel works. And then there are some that require both. So they require it to be a certain voltage and have that chemical stimulus to, that's not on here, but that also have the chemical stimulus to open. And then finally, we have leakage channels, which are just always open. And they're always just sort of letter, letting ions peter in and out as they will. And so the reason why you want that, well, does anybody have a guess as to why you'd want leakage channels always kind of letting ions in and out? So the reason why you'd want that is if you don't have a flow of ions, then you don't have current. And it needs to maintain, how it needs to have a current over the membrane so that it can use that to activate it and fire a charge. So you need ions that are always kind of slipping in and out to have that electricity um, or those potentials moving across. Um, but of course, that means that the neuron has to do work to maintain its its membrane potential and make sure that it doesn't just go to zero. So how it does that is with these leakage, these leakage, so the leakage channel is what I was just talking about, how they come in and out. Um, but then it has these things called sodium potassium pumps. And this is actually the part of your brain that uses the most energy. About 30% of the energy that goes up to your brain is just 
do, is just doing these pumps, which are just taking um, sodium and pushing it out, and potassium and pulling it in. Sodium out, potassium in. And it requires energy to do that. Um, so here's just a little animation. So again, we have these blue ones, which are potassium, and they're coming in. And those red ones, which are sodium going out. And then you have a little bit of ATP, which is your energy being used up there. And then as you can see with these positive and negatives, it's just maintaining that membrane potential that it wants to, which again is negative 65 millivolts. Um, here's Drake to help you remember that a little bit. Um, same idea, we've got sodium going out and we've got our potassium coming in and he's using energy as he dances to do that. All right, the action potential. So this is, now we're getting into how the neurons are actually taking electricity and sending it to another neuron and harnessing this previously stored up potential energy and actually using that to transmit the signal. So action potentials are all or nothing, nothing events. Once they start, they cannot be stopped. And they move from the top of the axon, which is called the axon hillock, all the way down and then out through all of the branches um, at the end of the neuron. And it is a chain reaction, again, that cannot be stopped. It's a chain reaction of opening and closing ion channels. All right, so I'm going to go through and explain how this actually works, how the, how the action potential works as we go through. And I put this little key up there because it's very important to remember where each of these ions wants to go and what they want the neuron's voltage or membrane potential to be. So if we remember, the sodium up there, as it says, wants the inside of this neuron, wants the membrane potential to be positive 60 millivolts. And right now, it's negative 65 millivolts on the inside, so it doesn't like that. And since it's positive, the way that it would make it positive 60 millivolts um, inside is rushing in. So it really, really wants to come in with a lot of force. And so when the neuron is stimulated, and we'll talk about how that happens earlier, but let's just say that it's stimulated back here, then, these, then uh, that's going to allow for a lot of sodium to, that's going to trigger these voltage-gated channels that then allow a bunch of sodium to come in. So if I come over here just to kind of show you what this is, what this is like here, we have uh, electricity that stimulates the neuron somewhere down on that side, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. And if it reaches negative 55 millivolts, so this electricity, these ions coming in are doing what we call depolarization. So it's very polarized right now because it's down at negative 65 millivolts. And then when it's depolarized, it comes up to zero. So it starts to depolarize it. And it could depolarize a little bit and then come back down, depolarize a little bit, come back down. But if it reaches negative 55 millivolts on the inside, so again, this membrane potential raises from negative 65 to negative 55, then we get this huge spike all the way up and then it comes back down. And this spike happens because at this point here, this voltage is what triggers all of these sodium channels to open. So that voltage makes these snap open, and now we have a ton of potential energy stored that's using these sodium, that's um, engaging these sodium ions and having them flow into the, into the axon, into the cell. So that's what's happening on this rush up here. And so we have zero millivolts here, but it keeps coming up because, again, sodium wants it to be positive 60 millivolts on the inside. Um, but as soon as we cross zero here, then the neuron is like, okay, we got to stop this. It's going, it's going too positive, and it likes it to be at negative 65. So what does it do? It causes um, potassium, uh, potassium ion channels that are also voltage gated to open. So over here, on the left side there, with, uh, the potassium ion channels start to open, and that is triggered right at zero millivolts. So it continues to still go up a little bit because of how strong that reaction is. But the other thing that happens is that these guys close very, very forcefully at that point. 
So it's going up, but the sodium ones slam shut. There's a little ball that actually goes into them and slams them shut so that, they, so that nothing can get through. And now that these potassium ions are in there, they're really, really unhappy. They are positive, so they're making it more positive in there, and they want it to reach negative 97 millivolts. So now they rush out, and as these positive ions leave the cell, as they leave the axon, that is making the membrane potential sink back down and sink back down very quickly. And it kind of undershoots a little bit here, and then those ion channels close. And then this little part here is those sodium potassium pumps that are helping to um, now take that potassium, bring it back in as it pushes out the sodium. How are we with that? That was a little bit confusing. Please feel free to ask questions if you have any. I'm going to take some water. We're good, really? Awesome. That is a pretty complex topic, so I'm glad, because I'm happy to explain it further if anybody needs, but that is, that is the general process. So we have the sodium rushing in when the voltage reaches negative 55. This becomes a chain reaction moving down, because we have these ions in here, causing the next one, the next one to go. And then as this charge is moving down, as these ions are kind of randomly moving in this direction, we have these potassium ones getting, these potassium ion channels getting triggered. And now they're sort of closing this and returning the membrane potential back to negative 65. So this is just sort of a little animation of that. Like I said, it's a chain reaction. And so I will talk a little bit more about that on the next slide, but hopefully you can kind of see how that's going. We have that progressive as the, as the ions move down. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, at the nodes, yes. Um, so I will talk a little bit more about that in, uh, in a second, but yes. These, the myelin sheath, these cells around here, are designed to prevent those ion channels um, from forming in these areas. So the ion channels only form in these areas, and I will talk about that in a second. It's a very good question. So this just kind of shows us, again, that this is uh, a chain reaction. So the blue starting on the outside, this means that this is our sodium. And you can see it moves in very quickly and then gets sucked back out. These are our potassium. You see that goes out very quickly. And this is that action potential graph that was over on the other side. You can kind of see where it goes up and then comes back down again. And um, if you were to record at many, many different spots all the way down the axon, you would see this channel moving across just like we see there. So if you have a really, really strong stimulus, this doesn't mean that the neuron is going to have a bigger, like a, a bigger fire on that graph that we just saw. So the size of these action potentials, as measured with voltage here, are always going to be the same. And this is that same graph that I showed you before that was right over here. But this is what it actually looks like scaled correctly um, within you know, a, a real graph that's being recorded from active neural activity. And so up here, we just have a square wave of stimulus. And so this is just electricity applied artificially, but it can simulate what it would be like having neurons stimulate it. And so we can see that this, uh, this small square wave here does raise it, but it doesn't raise it to negative 55. So it does maintain, it's a, it's a little bit depolarized from where it is at zero but that doesn't cause an action potential. And as soon as that goes away, it returns back to rest at this negative 65 millivolts. Then when we apply a medium intensity, so a little bit more voltage than this one, we do start to see spiking fairly consistently for the duration that that voltage is applied onto the neuron. And so when we have, but when we have a really, really high um, injection of current here, we don't see these, uh, these peaks get any higher. It's the same but we see that frequency go up quite a bit. Um, and these can fire up to once every millisecond. And so they activate once every millisecond. And the reason why we have that, um, that maximum is you need time for those ion channels to open and close and for the neuron to reset itself with the sodium potassium pumps. 
All right, so to answer your question for the myelin and, um, and where those ion channels are on the axon, um, so there are a couple of things that, the, that neurons can do to change how fast these action potentials travel down the neuron. So in a human, um, well, just in, in neurons in general, the absolute fastest, the speed limit that charge can move down um, uh, move down an axon is 256 miles per hour, which is actually pretty slow if you compare that to electronics, compare that to electricity, which theoretically can travel at the speed of light or approaching the speed of light. Um, I don't know what that figure is off the top of my head, but it's certainly a lot more than 256 miles an hour. Um, and so, but, there, but they can also be quite a bit slower, and that timing is very important because the brain and the nervous system learns to use different timings for biological clocks, for example, and for prediction, because it knows how long it takes different neurons to transmit signals. And so you can vary this based on the, the length of, of the axon um, and the time it takes to go from, um, the, the time it takes for the action potential to move from one area to the next. And sorry, and this is the length um, the distance that it can travel before it loses a lot of that charge. I can talk about this more at the end if, if people are curious about, about that piece. But the important things here are you can change these properties, um, the amount of time that it takes to excite uh, the, the ion channels down the axon, and the length of time that it can travel. You can change that by increasing or decreasing the fiber diameter, so that axon can be very, very small and thin or it can be large. And if it's large, um, you're going to have a lot more ions flowing through. It just think of a pipe. It, that's kind of the same, uh, the same type of thing. You have more water going through if it's larger. And then myelination, which, is, which are those little cells that are going down. And they kind of act as insulation. So if you think of um, a wire, that insulation is going to allow that charge to travel a little bit farther because it's keeping that charge within there. And so it's a very similar thing with the myelin sheath, um, which you can see here. So this is what the actual cell looks like. Here's the cell body up at the top, that little white bit, and then it just wraps itself around, wraps itself around, wraps itself around, until you have these little nodes um, that, are, that make up the myelin sheath. And so if you were just to have an axon without any of these myelin on it, which there are several in the body, just again, it uses it for timing um, of areas that can use a little bit of a slower signal. If you were just to have that, then it's slower because you have to have that progressive chain reaction all the way down. Like consistently at every point, you have to keep activating those sodium channels and then the potassium channels, the sodium and the potassium. And if you have these myelin, it allows the charge to jump from here to here, from here to here, from here to here. So those ions, those sodium ions that are now in here kind of spread out, spread out, spread out, and then they make this become negative 55 and then shoot up, and then same thing here, negative 55 and shoot up, and it continues all the way down. So that speeds it up, but if you make those myelin too long and too thick, then you lose that signal. So, um, but the, that varies a little bit from place to place, but for the most part, you know, that isn't an issue. Um, Although in multiple sclerosis, what you're having is a breakdown of these myelin, these Schwann cells, or in the, um, in the brain, oligodendrocyte cells, um, they start to break down, and you don't have those myelinated axons. And so those signals do not transmit as well. Some of them don't get there, and other ones just go a lot slower. All right. So once this action potential comes all the way down from through the axon, it reaches the end, which is the axon terminal, also called the axon bouton. And now it wants to transmit a signal to another neuron, because that's the whole purpose of it doing that anyway. Um, in the first place is it wants to communicate, and it needs a method to communicate. So there are two types of synapses. You have these over on the side called gap junction or electrical synapses. And they're called electrical synapses because they just basically take charge. They take those ions, and they just move them from one neuron to the next one um, without any intermediary. So this is basically just a wire. 
there's no difference in the signal that starts up here and down here. It's just pushing that through. Um, the benefit is that they're very fast, but the downside is that they don't really do any processing. They are just wires. We have, humans have mostly chemical synapses, which are a lot more complicated and I will go over next. But basically, the big benefit to this is that it allows us to do processing in the individual neurons. Because of this system, which I'll explain, um, now neurons have a choice based on the stimulation that they're getting here and from other neurons, do I want to fire or do I not want to fire based on the information that I'm getting from lots and lots of neurons. So it's no longer a wire now. Now each neuron gets the opportunity to make a choice based on um, the information that it's getting. But these are a lot slower because they rely on that diffusion to come across the membrane. And there is a physical, there is a, a physical gap between neurons um, where there is not for the electrical synapse. All right. So I am going to just explain the process of, I actually think I'm going to draw it because I think that might make it a little bit easier. But so again, we have this, um, we have the axon coming down. And this is called the axon bouton here. And so that's what it's showing up there. Also the presynaptic terminal because it is before the synapse. And then we have the postsynaptic terminal right here, which is the dendrite. So the axon and the dendrite down there. And in this axon, so the charge is coming down. And in this axon, we have these little uh, spheres called vesicles that have chemicals called neurotransmitters in them. Um, and you've probably heard of many neurotransmitters like dopamine and serotonin and epinephrine adre and ad slash adrenaline. Um, there are lots of different neurotransmitters that the brain uses in different ways. Um, but basically, they are packaged in these little areas at the end of the axon. So they're all, they're all sitting in here. So we have this chain reaction that's coming down. And there are ion channels here as well, because um, it's still part of the axon. And when these reach down here, the difference is that these ion channels are now mostly calcium. And if we remember, I wonder if I have it here. Uh, I do not. But if we remember back to those previous slides, calcium wants the membrane to be really, really positive. I think it's 137. It's somewhere, somewhere around there. Um, so they want it to be really, really positive at the inside. So they rush in with even more force than the, than the sodium does. So we have a lot of calcium coming in here, because these are voltage gated as well at negative 55 millivolts. And so we have a lot of calcium coming in. So this is CA plus plus. And so now this starts to get really, really depolarized. And what that does is it engages these little proteins that look like a hook. And they kind of lasso these vesicles. And they pull them down, all down to the membrane down here. Um, and there are some really cool animations that kind of show how it does this. But basically, there are these little proteins that just grab this, and then they pull it down. and then. This here, there's a membrane there that merges. So if it's a circle here, it's coming down. And then it kind of merges with this. And then it lets all of this neurotransmitter out into this general area here. So now we have a lot of this chemical um, that is floating around in the interaxonal space, or the, sorry, the, in the synaptic cleft. And so this is just kind of floating around. And then on the dendrite, we have a lot of these ion channels as well. But these are those ligand-gated ion channels that I was talking about. So that means, so ligand again means chemical. And these little neurotransmitters are going to bind to a lot of these ion channels, opening them. And now we have ions flowing in. And these ions could be sodium, which is going to make the membrane potential depolarized. So we're adding charge in, making it want to fire. Or it could be chloride, which if we remember has a negative charge, 
meaning that it's making it less likely for that to fire. Um, so this is sort of what happens at that part. And then after that, there are these little channels called reuptake channels. And these neurotransmitters start to get sucked up into these channels so that they can be recycled. That's one way. They can also just kind of diffuse off, or there are little cells, astrocytes, that can eat them. Because you don't want, you don't want these neurotransmitters just floating around here forever, because then it's going to keep stimulating this neuron over and over and over again. And we want to, you know, the brain wants to make sure that this is controlled, so that only when this one fires, right after this one does, and then it's cleaned and kind of pushed away. But it's at these sites here that a lot of like pharmaceuticals and, and drugs act on the brain. And this is how most of that functioning is, is changed. So a common, um, a common drug that's prescribed for depressive disorder are SSRIs, which is selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. Um, and that's like Prozac or fluoxetine, um, drugs like that that you may have heard of. And basically what they do, so again, it's selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor. So this is that reuptake. And they basically just give this a little hug. And they make it harder for these to open so that these can't rush back in as much. Because the idea, the theory behind why we have depression is that this signal isn't strong enough from this neuron to this neuron, the ones that use serotonin in the brain. And it's been shown that that affects mood. So if we restrict these, that means that these are in this cleft for longer. They can stimulate this neuron more. And that's shown in some people and a lot of people to have a positive effect, effect on mood. So here's just a little animation of what I just said going on over here. So again, we see in this ion channel calcium, which is blue coming in that pushes these vesicles down to the edge of the axon, and those neurotransmitters move out into the synaptic cleft. And then they cause our potassium ions, or sodium ions, or whatever it is, should be sodium, um, to come in and actually stimulate the, the neuron. So how are we feeling with all of that? Are we good? Good, good, good. Yeah, so again, here are, here are all the steps. We've gone over, we've gone over all of those. Um, just making sure that we're good. Yeah, OK. All right, so EPSPs and IPSPs. This stands for excitatory and inhibitory postsynaptic potential. I know, it sounds very exciting. But um, so this is what we're talking about when we get into the actual dendrite. So we had an action potential. That's what we refer to with signals in the axon. That's that big, that big signal that we talked about. And then IPSPs and EPSPs are the same idea, but for dendrites. And so there are just two types of responses um, based on, so there are two types of channels. So you have ionotropic and metabotropic. Which you're not going to have to remember those, those terms, but I'm going to bring up this later because it's important in, in learning and memory. But these ionotropic are just very small um, ion channels that open in response to, to chemicals, in response to neurotransmitters, and then they close after the presence of those have, have gone. These metabotropic ones, when they have, these are the ones that I was talking about that are both electric and chemical. So these require the presence of both of those to fire. And so first you have, you have to have these ionotropic ones, these just simple ones, opening and closing and depolarizing this membrane, bringing it closer to zero. And then if that's true and there is neurotransmitter connected here, it activates these proteins that go through and they just start opening all of the channels. So it creates this huge response. But most of the time we're just dealing with these little responses of chemicals coming in. So um, how are we on time right now? 6.50. OK. All right, I'll be able to finish this part then. Almost there. Um, OK, so we have, 
the excitatory postsynaptic potentials, which means that we're exciting the neuron, we're bringing it closer to fire, we're telling it to fire. And so we see this little blip in the positive direction, bringing it towards zero, because again, it's down at negative 65. And then we have these inhibitory postsynaptic potentials, which are these IPSPs, which tell it to, um, to not fire and to go down. So these kind of fight each other, and different neurons will tell it to fire, different neurons will tell it not to fire. They fight each other, and then based on which one wins, the neuron will decide to fire or decide not to fire. Um, that's a very simplified process of what I was talking about before, where neurons can pull together different signals and make a decision based on what is stimulating them. Whoops. So just to see what this looks like, um, you have you know, with one stimulus, a little bit. With two stimulus, they add together. And three, they add together. So these are all those excitatory postsynaptic potentials. The more of them, the higher up it goes. And we're starting to approach that negative 55 that it needs. So once that signal gets up there, then it'll fire. But the other thing that's important to remember is that so now these, um, these dendrites do not have that same reaction that axons do where if it stimulates over here, it'll move all the way down. Instead, they're just opening and closing in response to what's going on right in that specific area. So a receptor might reach negative 55, but once it gets to the soma, which is where that decision is made to fire, that signal may have dropped down quite a bit because of those leakage channels pulling out those ions as they go through. So really, you need a really strong signal in a lot of these places to make the neuron fire because you have to raise the, the soma, the cell body, up to that negative 55 to get it to fire. So there are two ways that the there are two ways that the axons can do this. So there's temporal summation, which just means more stimulation in a small period of time, so just faster stimulation. So we see one excitatory postsynaptic potential here brings it up, but it doesn't get us to that negative 55. It's, it's not that high. But then over here, if you have three rapid stimulations, that's three rapid um, signals from that axon that it's connected to, then these start to grow. And you know another probably one more, and it would cause an action potential down here. But they, they sum on top of each other. And then the other way is just with multiple axons connecting to it. So you can see that. With this, if they're all stimulated at the same time, we get a much bigger one, a much bigger potential than we do if there's just one. Um, and the placement of those axons on the dendrites matters a lot, too, because the closer that you are to the cell body, the, um, the closer you are to the cell body, the more that those axons affect it. So there are lots of areas in the brain where you might want better signals from from some neurons, like for example, if you don't want a neuron to fry itself, you might have a really, really strong response from some inhibitory neurons that tell it, OK, you need to, you need to shut up what, no matter what you know, the other stimulus you're getting from the other neurons is. All right. So learning and memory. Um, there is the adage in neuroscience, neurons that fire together, wire together. This is the principle that underlies neuroplasticity, but also in neurodevelopment. This is how neurons connect to each other and build up those connections. So I'm going to come back over to, to this drawing here. So this is just the standard how signal transmits from one neuron to another. But this can change a lot. This diagram can change based on if neurons want to listen to the previous neuron more or less. And so if, for example, you have a set of neurons that's trying to figure out what animal you're looking at, right? And you, and maybe you're like a, a little kid, you're seeing an animal for the first time, and you see a horse, and you say that it's a dog. Because you see, you, you see brown, you see four legs, and you're like, oh, I know that that's a dog. But then you're told that that's not correct. So you would not, this neuron that triggers that says, oh, it's a dog, would not want to listen to the inputs that told it that it was a dog that were wrong. And, but the inputs that were correct, when it does see a dog, it would want to listen to those, um, to those inputs. I don't know if that, does that make sense, kind of? I didn't explain that super well, but it might make more sense after I go through this. So 
if this neuron likes the input that it's getting from this one, it wants to listen to it more, and it's going to have a stronger response to it in the future. So the ways that it does that are it can, one, put more channels down here. So more channels means more responsiveness to this, to these neurotransmitters, meaning that we have more ion flow into this area. Um, the other thing that it can do is send a signal to this neuron saying, hey, send more neurotransmitter, causing this to fire more. And the final thing that it can do is just tell this neuron to send another axon, and then this dendrite will send another dendrite to connect to. So these dendrites and axons, they can make multiple connections to each other. And the more that it wants to listen to that response, so if this gave it the correct response and it wants to listen to that more in the future, it's going to keep building out more of this infrastructure to connect to that. However, the opposite is also true if it's trying to break a connection. So if there was an association that these neurons made that's incorrect, it's getting negative feedback, now it starts to remove these extra branches and remove some of these ion channels and have less neurotransmitter until sometimes the synapse is just not usable anymore. So yeah, um, so this is just kind of that process. We started, there was strong input from this central one and that caused it to fire. So it started to like this one better than the other ones. And then even though at the end, these other ones are stimulating it, it really listens to that center one. And so if that center one is saying something different than the one surrounding it, it's still going to listen to that center one because it, it likes it more. And you can see um, as, the, as um, it wants to break that, that signal apart, as it doesn't want to listen to those anymore, the ion channels start to go away. Time? 57? All right, we'll go quickly. So connectomics is the study of the brain structure and function, and it creates these really, really beautiful maps. So this is all of the axons, all of the connections in your brain represents your connectome. And your connectome is completely unique from, from somebody next to you. On the small scale, these neurons all connect in very unique ways to represent your experiences and memories. And I think that this is something that's really beautiful about the brain, that you have this physical structure that is you know, certainly more unique than a fingerprint or any other measure that you can have. And it's molded by your experiences. And so um, a friend recently lost someone, someone close to him. And, uh, and kind of one of the things that we were, that we were talking about, because uh, he's interested in, in neuroscience as well, is that people in your life get impressed upon this connectome that is, that is in your head. And so the person that he lost had a huge influence on him in his life. And there are physical representations of that person in his brain. Because people that influence you and experiences that influence you make physical connections that guide your behavior and your thinking process in the future. And I just think that it's kind of cool that all of that stuff, all of our thoughts, are represented in physical structures that are completely unique to our individual brains. And so all of these images are from something called the Human Connectome Project, which you can go check out. You can download their data and play around with it on your own if you're interested. Um, but these are all MRI uh, images of axons and channels um, that are in your brain. So if you're interested in, in looking at those, there are some really, really pretty images. And that's where they all come from here. So we should probably call it then, do this next time. Or do we have somebody coming in? Sure. Is everybody good for like five more minutes? We're good? OK. All right, so finally, we talked about how neurons connect individually to each other, and then a little bit about how they create these huge connection patterns on the large scale. But what are they actually doing in these small circuits where they're connecting to each other? What does this mean? when we start to add uh, more and more of these, where does cognition arise out of that? So some very simple circuitry um, is, so this is in uh, your spinal cord and in your arm. 
these are your reflex circuits. So when you touch something hot and you pull away, that signal, um, that happens before it even reaches your brain. I think we've all probably experienced that. You feel that before the pain um, even gets to your brain, or your, your arm pulls away before the pain even gets to your brain. And that's because we have these very, very simple um, feedback circuits that are within our spinal cord. So when the muscle, in this case, when the muscle gets overstretched, that signal gets sent here back to the spinal cord, and we have a little inhibitory neuron that this activates. So this comes here, it excites the inhibitory neuron, which means that now the inhibitory neuron is going to fire, and that means that it's going to inhibit the thing that's actually making, the neuron that's actually making this muscle fire. So I know that that's a little bit confusing because it excites an inhibitory thing that ends up inhibiting the actual action. But again, we have, you know, it's telling this inhibitory one to fire, which makes, which stops the action that's going overall. And this is a stronger connection than the connection up to the brain. So this inhibitory uh, sequence overrides that signal coming in and tells it to stop, to move the other way, or to stop flexing so you don't hurt yourself. This can get increasingly complex as we go up into the brain and look at some other systems. Um, so this is the retina. These are your rods and cones. Um, here, here they are again imaged um, with some of those, the virus staining that I was talking about earlier. And, and so you can just kind of see this is the structure of these cones. They respond to light and then send a signal down through, through, the, um, through the cell and then emit neurotransmitter out at the bottom. And these start to form even at the really basic level in your retina. This is just in your retina on the back of your eye. They start to connect together and do some very, very basic processing. So what actually gets sent out to your brain is this one cell, it's called a ganglion cell, that aggregates information from many, many, many different um, photoreceptor cells. So this is only showing three, but it's often several dozen that combine into this one cell. And so the brain is only getting stimulation from what this one is. And so what's happening down here is these cells have to make a decision based on what they're seeing here. And so we have these that like it when, for example, what it's looking at, the light coming on here is dark. And then this one likes when there is bright light coming on it. And so they kind of fight each other based on the stimulus that's coming in and whether it meets up to what the neurons like or not. So if it's bright or if it's dark, then they kind of fight that out and then that one signal gets sent out here. And so that is just kind of the start of the visual system. That's one, uh, that's one small point. And then these kind of add up together and get those individual um, axons and neurons that go out to the brain. And this is sort of that starting point. Um, this is arm thing is still up there. So then another very, very simple um, circuitry thing, uh, another simple circuitry diagram is in an area called the thalamus. So we talked about last time, uh, which is right in here. So we talked about last time that the thalamus is an area that's basically just like a super highway of information. Signals are just coming through there. But there is some very basic processing done in here as well, again, with one of those inhibitory circuits. So this is that cell that I said was sending a signal out to the brain before um, coming in here. And this is, the main, this is the main cell in this area that would send up the signal to the other parts of your brain that can begin processing. But we have these little local inhibitory circuits and actually a signal getting sent back down from this area. And what these do is help refine the image by constantly checking and making that area start over to make sure that what you're seeing is actually true and not changing. And so when it changes, then these inhibitory circuits kind of cut that off right here and prevent it from sending signal up to that upper area. So these are just very, very basic um, circuitry that help maintain the quality of the information by checking to make sure that it's still there. And this I'm not going to go through, but this is how complex the brain actually can get um, with this. So this is a 
somewhat complete wire diagram of just the visual areas of the brain. Um, and so each one of these areas has its own local circuitry that's doing processing. I showed you the most simple ones, which are those center surrounds, that first thing in the eye and then in the thalamus. But these get increasingly complex as they go around. And all of these are connected back to each other, sending those inhibitory signals back and excitatory signals forward to constantly refine that image and be checking um, what you're looking at, finding features, and determining how you want to respond to it. But you can see it gets crazy complicated and recruits billions of neurons um, in the process of just looking around and analyzing visual information. Um, two slides left here. So this is just kind of a very, very, very oversimplified process of how we, uh, how we decide on information and how neural networks work. So each of these would represent many clusters of neurons, um, but we're going to pretend that they're individual neurons. Uh, several years ago, it was probably 15 years ago now, scientists um, to great fanfare proclaimed that they found a neuron that responds to Jennifer Aniston, the Jennifer Aniston neuron. And in a subject that they were recording from, they found that every time he saw a photo of the actress, regardless of what her hair looked like or what situation she was in, this one neuron would fire and it didn't respond to other people. And so, of course, that neuron, I'm sure, did many, many other things. Um, but it's a good uh, way to illustrate how these networks actually function. So we have neurons that select for different features all the way through the brain. And so we start by, like in the eye, very, very simple, looking at edges, looking at light and dark. And those build up to look at shapes. Maybe it's a circle, maybe it's a square. What direction is it moving? What color is it? And so we have different neurons that represent different features. And so we can say, OK, I'm seeing the color brown. I'm not seeing the color red. So this one's not going to fire because there wasn't red, but there was brown, the color of her hair, maybe. And so we have many neurons that respond to brown, and then they branch out to see, um, or I guess this is, you, you have many neurons that respond to brown, and it would look for other features that are also being validated um, to continue that, that trend of where it's going. So it would be looking for maybe the shape of her hair, so we know that that is brown hair. And then down here, you're recognizing this shape, this oval, which could be the, the shape of her face. And then you go down and realize down all of the things that could possibly be an oval, and then other signals kind of coming in tell you that it's a face that I'm looking at. So this oval ends up being a face. And then you put together individual features. So you know that Jen has brown hair, and it looks like blue eyes, and, and a certain voice. And then all of that kind of aggregates together and ends up picking who Jennifer, uh, picking Jennifer Aniston and firing in response to, to that person specifically. So it's really just putting together a lot of features. And then at the end of that road, there's a neuron or set of neurons that once they reach a reasonable degree of certainty, they fire and um, decide that's Jennifer Aniston. And then downstream, they you know, give you all of the information, like memories about her, ways to say her name, anything like that. All right, and so this is, this is the last slide here, um, which is just showing in monkeys their responses to different faces, because humans and, and monkeys alike are really, really good at identifying faces. And so what scientists did is they just took these images, and they put them up on the screen, and then they recorded from areas of their brain that are used to identify faces. And so this is just a histogram that shows the amount of neurons firing at a given time point. And so you can see that for all of these, because they have some features of a face, we are getting activity. There is even low activity in these areas because you know this is a component of a face, a circle, a component of a face, component of a face. But you can see the closer that we get to what a face actually looks like, like the monkey's face here, or this here, we have a lot more firing. And over here, this is kind of interesting. Um, facial features like a mouth or like eyes are darker usually than uh, what is around them, at least in this um, breed of monkey. And so the white eyes and white mouth does not respond as well to the black eyes and black mouth. 
Um, but this is just one very, very small feature um, that the brain encodes. But this is sort of how you study this. You record from an individual or set of neurons in this area and watch as you prevent, present different stimulus. OK, I will call it there. <laughs> Let's.